um, let me share my screen. So um, let's get this out of the way first. So we have, um, for today I'm presenting this chapter 13 and we have someone for chapter 14, which is Boris is gonna present strength. Thankfully, because I hate strength and well, I don't hate them. Hate is a strong word, but string, I'm not the best at them. And then thankfully Nelson will present regular expression because yeah, again, not my best. Then I present um, factors. So we, we have February covered, but then March for dates and times, which I think it should be John, to be honest with you, the one that presents that chapter, but we'll see if he's gonna be available or not. So that he can talk about dates and times, but so that chapter is open and then missing values too, which I don't think it's going to be a very long chapter. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, so let's make sure we have people for those two chapters for March. We have time, but still. Um, and then, so for today, we have chapter 13, which is numbers. So essentially, we're going to learn how to work with numeric vectors. So anything and everything related to numeric vectors. So what can we do with those values, right? So first, um, we are going to go through the recycling rule. Um, and then understand like how does R recycle some numbers when we are computing some functions or when we're using some function. Then we're going to understand how numeric transformations work or the most common numeric transformations, how we can uh, make sure we understand like when we're doing the minimum, the maximum value logarithms and things like that. And then summary functions, which are gonna be um, reducing a distribution to one value, which would be the mean, standard deviation, quantiles, so, so that. Um, okay, so let's start. So first, let's go over numeric vectors. So, the numeric vector is going to be a data frame or just a vector. So that's not a numeric vector, but when we're dealing, what we're talking about today, which is numeric vectors, it's going to be either in a data frame or just as a vector. Um, so how to make these numbers? If you have string, sometimes we have a string and then we have to, or we need to come, uh, transform it into a number. We're going to do an overview of count. Um, which is one of the most used functions from Dick Ladder, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're also going to go through numeric transformations that I already said. Some of them go very well with mutate, but sometimes we want to use them with summarize too, although more often with mutate. So the prerequisites are going to be to download or to install um, the package of Studyverse and NYC Flights 13, which is gonna, which is a data package, so that we can have that uh, the flight uh, data to work with. And I don't usually like to load the Tidyverse completely because it's like um, it's like a lot, a lot of packages, but that's what was in the chapter, so that's why I have it here. Okay, so let's start by making numbers because I'm gonna go. A little fast, but um, it's because it's a very long chapter. Um, okay, so let's start. So making numbers. Usually numbers are recorded as integers or as double, but sometimes you, you have pesky strings, right? Like something went wrong with your data when you were importing it, or you didn't specify that you needed to, um, to, to have that specific column as a numeric value, uh, or your NAs are not necessarily um, You're not using NA as your not available value. Sometimes you have like N and then uh, lowercase v or something like that. There, I've seen all kinds of crazy things. So then they're not recognized essentially as numbers or either an integer or a double. So then um, they are imported as strings. Luckily, read R, the package read R, has two functions to help parse strings into numbers. So those functions are parse double or parse number. So the parse double is um, should be used when you have numbers written as strings and parse number when you have strings 
that have non-numeric text that you want to ignore. So let's see a couple of examples here. Let's say we have this vector, which has the numbers 1.2 and 1e3. Um, so because we want to ignore that e, we just we, we, we just want to essentially uh, move it as a, so all of these numbers, right? We want them to be written as numbers, right? We don't want it to be recognized that E as a string or that I need it to, I need it for R to recognize it as a number. So I'm gonna do read R parse double so that R can understand that that E is not necessarily part of text, that it shouldn't be a string, right? Like that is essentially a number in scientific notation. So that's why I use uh, parse double for that vector or that column in a data frame. And then the other one, if you see, I have a vector y vector um, that has the dollar sign or the percentage sign in the other element. So I want R to ignore all those non-numeric text so that it can only extract the, the, the numbers. So then I do read R, uh, column, column, parse number, and that's exactly what happens, right? It ignores those non-numeric uh, symbols or text. So those two functions are super, super um, useful to keep things clean, right? When you're importing your data set. Then, uh, so let's go over counts. So count is one of the most used functions from dplyr. And essentially what it does is it's gonna count uh, how many values are in a group or in a category. So, yeah, yes, someone wanted to say something? Okay, let's continue. So then with, um, if we have this data that said flights, right, that have um, information on flight departure dates, it has departure time, how much time, uh, what, month, date, year, was that flight uh, departing, departing. So essentially if I do for that specific data frame, I wanna count how many, um, this column, which is called DST. DST just means it's like a, the number for each uh, one of the, the of the, um, what do you call them? Like each one of the, planes that is departing, uh, departing, I think. Each one of the, not the plane necessarily, but it's the, um, it it's a flight, I think it is. That's what it's called. So the, yeah, it's, it's, but it's is it the air, destination. Oh yeah, the it's destination. Airport. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's where it's, it's, yeah. It's where it's going, that's right. Okay, so, but this is essentially like a group, right, a category. So if I'm going to A and C, or how many flights are going to A and C, now I know because I did count to do that, that that's eight, right? And I can group this and do all kinds of other things. But essentially count is going to count. It's going to tally or it's going to estimate the number of occurrences for each one of my, in this case, uh, categories for this group. And I have to put that inside the uh, inside the count function, right? Like, what essentially am I counting here from like that the value or that the um, um, mm. the vector that I wanted to estimate, it, right? Like the um, the column. Okay, so let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, if I want to see the most common value from this count uh, thing that I just did, if I do sort equals true, what it's going to do, it's going to um, sort it in uh, descending order. So the most, the ones that have the highest count numbers are going to be first. And then if I do it, um, I can always do it the other way around too, right? So that, that sometimes it's usually it's useful right if you want to see like the ones that have the most um the most flights 
too, right? So Atlanta, LAX, those are obviously very popular airports. So if you want to estimate other summaries, then you can use N in order to, so that you don't, so count is gonna be used like, like unknown, like that. But if you wanna do in summarize, or it can, be, it can also be in mutate, but if you wanna do, um, you wanna count how many destinations, but in addition to that, you also wanna estimate the mean of the, um, how much time uh, the, the flight was delayed, the arrival delayed, right? Like how, how much time, which is in minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if I wanna know the mean of that, so because I'm doing two, then it's recommended to use N, right? So that's gonna be, count how many flights per destination, right? Because I have it grouped by destination. But in addition to that, I'm also um, estimating the mean of that uh, arrival delay. And the NARM is just so that it ignores all the NAs that are, uh, that are in that um, arrival delay or R delay column. And that's what I have here. So I'm going to have not just the counts or the tally of each one of the um, uh, airports that a flight's arriving, but I also going to have the second uh, the second call. Right. Other useful variants to count is, for example, unique values. Uh, this is one of the ones that I use the most. So um, and distinct is going to count the number of unique values of one or more variables. So it's not just going to count how many there are. It's just going to count how many distinct ones are, how many unique values are for each one of those groups. So in this case, if I group them by destination again, so these are airports that flights are arriving to, and then I want to sum summarize it by saying how many distinct carriers. So I think if a carrier is going to be like um, Spirit Airlines or American Airlines, I think that's a carrier. So how many distinct carriers are arriving to each one of them? And then arrange them in descending order so that I can see the top, uh, the ones that have the most carriers up top. And then that that's how I can do this, right? I, I'm going to do N distinct. I'm not necessarily counting how many carriers. I'm going to count how many distinct carriers there are in that uh, in that data plane, right? Like the unique carriers, it only counts them once, even if they are multiple times the same uh, same carrier. So that's N, um, but unique and distinct. Um, other useful variants to count is gonna be weighted counts. So weighted counts is gonna be um, using the function weight, uh, using the function count, but with the argument WT. So for example, here, again, for the slides, if I wanna count uh, tail numbers, I, I don't know what the tail number, I guess the tail number is gonna be the distinct identifier for a plane. And then, but I wanted to estimate it relative to the distance that they travel. So then I'm weighting it. This is like my weighing factor, right? I'm, I'm using distance as a, the weighing factors, not just count how many tail, um, how many um, flights there are for that tail number. I wanted to weigh it down by distance. So then that's that's how it goes. Um, other very useful variants to count is going to be missing values. So essentially, what I'm asking this or what I'm doing here is counting how many missing values there are on a specific uh, group. So in this case, again, I am grouping them by destination. So these are going to be my airports. And then I'm summarizing this. Day number for the flight, not the plane. Oh, OK. You guys, I don't. I should have used another data because I, I, I really don't know anything about planes. Um, OK, so yeah, so that's for the flight. So here, again, we have the airports. So if we want to know how many cancel flights there are, what I'm asking, um, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum 
how many NAs there are in this specific hole, which is going to be the parting time, right? Because if it's an NA, it means it never departed. So that's what I'm doing. I want to know how many, so sum, how many NAs there are in this color. So then this is going to be for um, each one of my airport because I group I grouped it by destination. And this is the number of NAs that we have. So sum used with an eighth is very um, it's a very useful way of combining these two functions um, to count the missing value. And this is one of the things I do all the time. Like this is one of the most my most used uh, ways of summarizing data, right? Okay, now let's move to numeric transformation, which is gonna be first uh, essentially understanding these recycling rules. So there are a lot of transformation functions that work well with mutate because the output is going to be the same length as, as the input, right? Because if we, we do summarize, then it's going to alter the, the output. Um, but anyway, so first of all, let's understand these recycling rules. So when the so you are going to have like two sides to um to an operation here in, in R. So you're gonna have the left and right hand side to the assign uh, operator. So this is gonna be the left, in this case, the X, and then the right side of the assign, uh, the right to the assign uh, operator. It's gonna be the content that goes into that uh, object name X. So they are, um, Essentially, sometimes you're going to have different lengths, and then that's what R is going to recycle or repeat for the shorter vector. So if I have X in this case, it's going to have um, one, two, three, four elements, right? And then I'm saying that I want to divide each one of those values by five. So then I'm going to do, or R is going to do one divided by five is going to be 0 0.2. Two divided by five is going to be 0.4. 10 divided by 5 is 2, and 20 divided by 5 is 4. But what happens when I want to do something that, so that's the recycling, right? It's going to go through this 5. It's going to go through all of the um, elements of that vector. But if the shorter vector is length 1, uh, but if I have a shorter vector than a longer vector, then the recycling also happens, right? And we have to sort of be aware of how that is going to happen. So it's best if the shorter vector is length one, like what we had here with the five, it's just one. But R will recycle any short vector and sometimes will give you a warning. So in this case, for example, because we have four elements and we want to divide it by these two elements, then, or we want to combine them, right? So then, because it's a multiple, then it's going to go well. So let's see what this is doing. So I'm doing for each element of x, I want to multiply it by um, b12, right? So the uh, concatenation of these two. So then if I go to r, let me see if I can do. Wait. So then, well, I guess it's the same. It looks the same. Okay, so I can continue here, I suppose. So what it's going to do is going to be the first element multiplied by the first element in this um, in this second vector that I have. So it's going to be one by one. It's one, right? And then it's going to go for the second element of x multiplied for the second element of this other vector that I have here. So it's going to be two by two, and it's going to be four. And then it's going to go to the third element of x, and it's going to recycle or go back to the first element of this vector that I have here. So it's going to be 10 by 1, it's 10. 
and then the 20 will go to the two, right? So the 20 by two, it's gonna be 40. So that's the recycling. Because it's a multiple, like, right? Because we have here four and we have two here, it's very easy to do. The problem is when we have like this four elements in my vector, and then I wanna multiply it by three, by these three elements, then it's gonna have, it's gonna give me a warning that the length is not a multiple of the short of the vector. This is exactly how it looks, warning in this separation, the longer object length is not a multiple of the shorter uh, object length. So then it's gonna, so it's gonna do it, but this is how it's gonna look. So it's gonna do um, one by one, it's one. Then it's gonna go two by two is four. Then it's gonna go 10 by three, it's 30. And then this 20 is gonna multiply it by the first one. So that's how it's gonna recycle. And then it's gonna stop because there are no more elements in X. So that's how the recycling is gonna it's gonna go. So that warning is just letting you know that the uh, both vectors are not the same length. Okay. So then uh, this recycling situation is gonna keep happening and it's gonna keep happening with several other operations. Sometimes we're not even gonna be aware of that. So recycling rules are also going to apply to logical comparisons, which are essentially going to include all of these symbols, which are equal, equal, less than, less or equal than, et cetera. Right, so, and then we're gonna also see the difference between equal, equal, and uh, the in between the uh, percentage. So here you're finding, for example, um, flights, again, with the data frame flight. And I wanna filter this by the, uh, I wanna, I just want, I think I, let me see here, you are finding flights in odd number rows. Yeah, so essentially I wanna do, I just wanna see the flights that are in January and February, right? So that's why I'm using month one and two. But this is not the way to do this because if I do this, because of the recycling rule, what it's essentially doing is it's giving me for the first row and then it's keeping the second one and then giving me the third row. So it's essentially skipping one row. So if I do, so that, that's what it's doing. It's essentially skipping, just giving me the first and the third, the odd numbered rows for January, right? So it's giving me the first, the third, the fifth row for January. But then for the second month for February, it's gonna give me the even numbered rows, which is that one too, because I'm saying, give me the second, the fourth, the sixth, row. So this is not how I do this thing where I'm telling it, give me all the lights that were in February and January. So you have to be very aware of that difference. So to do that, the correct way of doing that is you essentially filter it using it, this operator that I call it in operator. I really don't know how else to call it. But before I do that, I need to define what the um, the months are going to be. So if I already know that months are going to be numeric, like one, two, three, four, I name a, a vector saying I want one and two months, right? Like the, anything that goes or that has the number one or that has the number two, that's exactly what I want. So that's how you use this operator in. I could have, instead of, using the JF, I could have put this C12 in here too. It would have worked essentially the same way. And if I wanted um, the per year, for example, I could have said, give me anything, right, that it's inside 2013. This is just for 2013, but let's say that this has five years. So give me 2013 and 2014 and 2015, right? And then you would have Instead of one and two, you, you would have put here 2013, 14, 15, 15, right? So it's, so this in operator is super useful. And uh, so this is exactly the correct way of, of asking for this, right? If I just want 
a subgroup if I just want like a subset of of um of my big data frame, then that's how you, you would do it, at least using deep learning. Right? Um, then we have another numeric transformation, which is going to be minimum and maximum. These are going to be very easy. I think most of us have encountered them. The functions are p mean and p max, which is going to return the smallest and the largest value on each row. So let's look at this example. So if I have this data frame with two columns, X and Y, and these are the values for each one of my uh, columns. If I do, um, with that data frame, I do a mutate where I want a new column that's going to have the minimum value of X between X and Y and ignore the NAs, right? And then I'm going to do another column called max, which is going to give me the maximum number between the columns X and Y, right? Like choose between those two, which one has the maximum value. And that's exactly what I have. So here for min, it's gonna give me one because between X and Y, the minimum value was one and the maximum was three. For the second row is not, right? It's essentially not, not um, it's the other way around. And here for the third row, because I'm saying to ignore the NAs, it's going to give me the same number for both the minimum and maximum. So this is different from mean and max because P mean and P max is going to go for each row. If we just do um, mean and max um, are, are different because they're going to return a single value from multiple observations. So you have to choose which one to do, right? So in this case, if we do give me the minimum for um, between X and Y and give me the max for X and Y, it's going to go through all the values of X, which are going to be 1, 5, 7, and all the values of Y, which are 3, 2, and NA. And it's going to choose among all of those, which is the minimum and which has the maximum. So that's why it's repeating the same values in each row, right? Because it's going to be just one single minimum and one single maximum across all of the values uh, between X and Y. So that's a good distinction between those four functions. Another numeric transformation is called modular arithmetic, which in R, um, you are going to see it with this uh, division sign between the percentages or the uh, slash between the percentages, uh, which is going to compute the integer division and then just uh, percentage percentage is going to compute the reminder of that, that integer division. So if you do from the numbers one through 10, and I want to divide each one of them by three, this is what I'm going to have. And if I want to do the reminder, then this is what I have. So one divided by three, let me see how much is it. One divided by three is going to be 0 0.33. So then that's why I get a zero here. And for three, because three divided by three, right? It's gonna be one. So then that's essentially what it's giving me. It's just that first um that first digit before the point. <laughs> I don't know how to call that in English, you guys, because I took math in Spanish. Anyway, with the divisor, I think it's called in Spanish. Divisor. Not sure what it's called in. I think it's called the Anyway, I don't remember. Um, in the in English, I don't even know the word. But anyway, and then the reminder, it's gonna be given if I want the reminder instead of having the uh, just the the integer division. Then this is what I do. And this is the result. So we see an example here uh, with the slides thing. Uh, with the slight data frame, if I have, um, because I have the departure time not at a time uh, object, right? It's not uh, not object, but um, it's not a defined as a, as a time as time. It's defined as an integer: five hundred and fifteen, five hundred and twenty-nine, five hundred and forty. Right? It's not five column fifteen. 
So then this is how I could do this. If I want to separate hours and minutes, well, there are multiple ways to do it. I suppose this is a complicated one. <laughs> um, so you can just do a mutate and do the schedule departure time divided by 100. And then that's going to give me just the division rate because it's going to be 500 divided by 100, it's going to be 5. And then give me the reminder, which is how much is left. Uh, so just put it here in the uh, in the for the minutes. They keep used. I don't remember this argument. Let me just check what that is. Um, oh, keep used it so that. I don't remember what that oh okay so then it it's to control which columns are retained in the output so if I say used is it's gonna retain only the used columns instead of giving me the 20 original columns that flight have. Oh. Hmm. I had I had no idea that I could do that. Okay, well, anyway. So you can do with this argument of keep, you can say all, you can say used, unused, or none. Um, those are the four options. And I guess in this case, right, it made more sense to just keep the used one so that it doesn't give me that reminding remaining 20. Another numeric transformation that we can do, and I'm sure everybody is very familiarized with logarithms. So this is very useful when you're dealing with data that's ranging over multiple orders of magnitude and you want to convert, for example, exponential growth to linear growth. And there are multiple ways of multiple um, reasons why you would want to transform your data to a logarithm or to a log data. These are the most common ones. Uh, functions, which is going to be log, which has the natural log or the base e logarithm. If you want base 2, you just do log 2 and log 10, which is going to be base 10. These are the most used ones, but there are many, many more. Um, the other numeric transformation is going to be round, uh, which is going to essentially approximate a number or a result to the nearest integer. It has two arguments, x and number of digits so that you know how many digits you want to uh, in your final result. And it's important to know that round is going to use the round half to even or the bankers rounding rule. So that means that if a number is halfway between two integers, it will be rounded to the even integer. So in this case, for example, if I do round 123.456, and I don't put the number of digits, it's going to do it to the nearest unit, so 123. If I want two digits, essentially this is like saying digits equals zero, right? Okay. So if I do want digits after the point, then I do it like this. This is going to be my x or my number, and I want just two digits, two significant figures, I suppose. 45.69, I want that. Oh, that's but anyway, um, but then you can also use negative numbers here to approximate them to not uh, decimals, right? Like in this case, I have two decimal points. But if I do the negative, it's going to approximate it to the nearest 10 or the nearest 100 or the nearest unit or the nearest 1,000, right? So in this case, 45, I want it to round it to the nearest 10. It's going to be 50. Um, give me, uh, if you put a minus two and you say round it to the nearest hundred, right? That's what the minus two is going to symbolize. Then it's going to be zero because um, essentially round to the nearest hundred. Oh yeah, because the number doesn't have a hundred. It's not 145. It's not 345, right? So because it has a zero, zero hundred units, then it's that's essentially what it's giving you. Um, and here it's going to be 50 because it's 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, right? Like the nearest 10. Okay, anyway, 
moving on to cutting numbers. I've never used these guys, actually, the negative ones. I usually just do the digits, but so it was cool to know these things. OK, so cutting numbers into ranges instead of uh, instead of having them um, like they are, you want to break them up into discrete buckets. So you can do that with the function cut, and then you are going to specify the breaks. This is something that we do a lot in ggplot too, right? You specify you specify those breaks um, for your axis. So here with uh, my my vector, I have six elements in this vector, but I want it to be broken into these five categories or these five buckets. So what it what it's gonna do is it's gonna do um these are gonna be my levels it's from zero to five. So zero is not included, but five is gonna be included. I think that's how it's read, read right? Like the parentheses means in no, included and the bracket, I think it's not included, if I'm not mistaken. So then the five is going to be included, but the 10 is not going to be included. And then the 10 is going to be included, but the 15 is not going to be included. So those are going to be in my levels. So then um, give me, so for this one, what's the bucket that it, uh, that it belongs to? It's going to be the first bucket. So the second one, it's going to go to the same one. And the fifth is going to the same one. So then that means that the five is included. Wait a minute. Let me check if Cut said this before I say something. Bracket is included. Yeah. I remember. Remember that from school too, but then it, this thing made me made me suspicious. So then, but the zero, it's including it too, even though it's in the parentheses. So I don't know what's up with that. Let me let me see this. Uh, okay, zero. Oh yeah. Okay. So if I if I would have let me see, so I have a twenty. In is assigned to the 10, 15. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. So the bracket, the parentheses means it's not included. So zero is not included here. So if I have a zero here in, in X, it won't go to this category. It should go to the previous category. Right? And then the bracket means that it is included. So that means the five, if I get a five, that's going to go into this bucket. So then one is going to belong here, right? Because it's between zero and five. Two is the same thing. Five, again, five is included. 10 is going to go to the next bucket. No, 10 is going to go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's going to go to the third bucket. 10 is going to go to the, to the second bucket. Sorry. I'm yeah. 10 here needs to go to this bucket, one, two, three, four, and this, yes, and this is where it goes. Um, because 10 is included, yes. And then 15 should be in this one. Because 15 is included, and that's correct. And then 20 should go to the last one because 20 is included, and that's essentially the result that I got. Okay, there you go, sorry. Um, okay, so it's breaking them up into just these little buckets. Uh, that's essentially what it's doing. Values outside of the range of the breaks will become NA. So if something here doesn't belong to any of these categories, um, I'm essentially going to get an NA, right? Okay, moving on. Then I have ranks. 245, okay. Ranks. So ranks is essentially going to do um, a bunch of numbers that you have, a vector. Give me the rank that it belongs to, right? And if you have a tie, they are going to go to the same uh, to the same rank. 
and then it's going to skip the third one, right? And it's going to move to the fourth because these two belong to the second or are the second uh, assigned at, at two as a rank. That is going to jump onto the fourth. Okay, so then if I have this um, vector, one, two, three, four, and an A, and I want the minimum rank, so give me the smallest value, the smallest. Um, So give me the minimum rank, give me the number that belongs to the minimum rank. Uh, so then that, uh, no, 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 wait, wait. Assign a rank to each one of the numbers that I have here, but give me the lowest rank that it can be. Yeah, actually that's what I'm doing. So this one is gonna be the first one second, third, fourth, and obviously an A. Right, right, because they are already organized in order. Um, so if I go here to an example, um, oh, I'm using other, uh, other functions here. So there are, so minimum rank, that's easy, right? Like give me just organize my numbers, uh, assign them a rank. So if I do, okay, so these are other functions and I put them here, like the explanation. So there are other um, functions that you can do that are associated with rank. Like for example, mm -hmm. row number. So row number, what it's gonna do, what it's gonna do is it's gonna assign the number of the current row to that value. And the dense rank is gonna assign ranks, but doesn't leave any gaps. Uh, like minimum rank stuff. So this is the gap that I'm talking about, right? Like, because it's going from first, second, second, and fourth. fourth. That is essentially not assigning anything as rank three. So dense rank, what it's doing is it's not leaving any gaps. So it's going to go first, second, second, and then third, even if there's a tie. And then percent rank, it's just going to count the total number of values that are less than uh, the value that you have. And then it's going to divide it by the number of observations minus one. And then the cumulative or cumdit, what it's going to do is just going to be adding them up until they reach one. So if we see an example here, one, two, three, four, and an A, give me the row number that they belong to. Again, one, two, three, four, right? Like that's the, the row number that they have. And because I set, um, oh yeah, essentially, yeah, row number. Then I have dense rank. So that means assign the rank, but don't leave any any ranks. So even if there was like a tie here, it would just jump. And then this is gonna be the percent rank, which is gonna be the rank divided by the total and then minus one. So that it's in, in like a proportion number. And then this one is just, adding them up. Okay, then we have offsets. Um, so these offsets are essentially two main functions. So we have lead and we have lag. And it's, these two functions are allowed. We need to refer the values just before or after the value that you have. So for example, here, my first number is two in this vector. So give me the lag of x. So it's going to be the Give me the previous value for two. There isn't, right? Because the vector starts at two. Give me the previous value of five, and it's two, right? It's this one. Give me the previous value of 11, and I know it's five. So it's essentially just moving them one left, and lead is going to do the same, but moving them one up. So those are the offsets, right? Offset to the left or offset to the right. Then we have consecutive identifiers. And um, so the, the way that they are going through this is, let's say you have this problem. You want to start a new group every time some event occurs, right? And you can define that event as anything that you want. For example, you have, these are the times when someone visited a website and you want to break up these events into sessions. Oh, I'm sorry about that. This should be SS. 
these sessions are going to be every time the gap between these two events is more than five, because these are so um, at minute zero, someone visited my site, right? And then minute one, and so on and so forth. So if the difference between two of these values is more than five, which means that there was more than five minutes between two visits, between two activities, then I wanted to, I want R to assign it a new group number. So I do that by saying, based on time, which is this, right? If you subtract the lag time, which remember, it's gonna be the previous one, right? You're offsetting it to the left. So, and then my default, I'm essentially saying that it's gonna be the first, this one zero, so that it doesn't give me an NA, like we saw in the example before that it's gonna give me an NA here. So that's why I'm setting it so that the default is gonna be essentially always this first value. And then my gap is gonna be, I'm gonna define it as the different, um, so this one, right? That it's gonna be larger or equal to five. So what it does is essentially saying, okay, so this is your time column, zero, one, two, three, five, 10, 12. The difference or the lag, the difference between the time and the lag is gonna be the difference between zero and zero is zero, right? Between zero and one, the difference is one. The difference between one and two is one. But if we go here, for example, the difference between 20 and 27 is seven. So this is saying that it's true. This is a new group because the gap is larger than five minutes. So that's how you do it. Has gap, the, the difference, um, it has to be, so this difference, right, between the time and the lag has to be larger than five. There's another way to do this, um, to keep doing this, right? Because if you don't necessarily want the true, false, true, false, but essentially assign a number, a group number to this, this guy, then you just add uh, using the function consum of that gap. So give me the cumulative number of that group. So it's going to be zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. And then and because it changes to true, this is going to change to one. And then because it's false, 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 so nothing is changing. And then here, true is going to change. So it's going to give it a new number. So then it's going to go to group two. So now you know that all of this belong to one group, which essentially um, all of these visits were less than five minutes. And then because you have this jump, is because you had a visit that was uh, larger than five minutes, right? And then that's, that's gonna belong to another group, and then another. Um, and then you can also do this with assigning ID, a consecutive ID to each one of, um, of a different value. So in this case, they're doing, um, if you have a vector with repeated values and you want to group your data by ID of each value, so what you do is, let's say you have this table or this data frame where you have your groups in column X and then some values in column Y. If you group them by this ID, but you essentially indicate that the consecutive ID of X, right, like assign it, that consecutive ID to each one of my Xs and then just, um, size head, that means just cut them, right? Like just give me that first time that that ID appears. So essentially here, what it's doing is it's just giving me the, so A, all of this belong to the first ID. So that's the consecutive ID, but I'm not, but because I put here slice head, it's not giving me all three A's. It's just giving me the first one and then B, it was only one, so then giving me that, and it's assigning it to the second group. And then C is the third group, and instead of giving me two Cs, I only see one because I put slice head n equals one. 
if I would have put n equals two, then it would have given me the first two rows where that ID appears. Okay, so then we have the numeric summaries, which are center, mean, and median. Everybody knows how they work, right? We're gonna estimate the mean of a vector or a mean of a column, the median, same thing, 50% of uh, the data is gonna be before, the median and 50% is gonna be after that uh, median value. There's no mode function in base R. There could be maybe in another package, but it's not commonly used by statisticians because if you're dealing with this numeric value, then you are probably not gonna have the same value, right? Because it's gonna be like 0 0.25, 0 0.26, 0 0.27, not necessarily the, the same one. Um, so essentially nobody or very few people use it. Um, then you have other numeric types of numeric summaries, which are minimum, maximum, and quantile. Again, we already saw min and max gives you the smallest value or the largest value. Then quantiles, you define uh, the percentage of values that it's going to be uh, your cutoff. So in this case, if you write quantile x 0.25, it's going to give you the value of x that is greater than the 25% of all the values that you have. So that's gonna be like your cutoff, right? Below all that value that this is gonna give you is 25% of the rest of your data. And then you can put 0 0.5, 0 0.95, et cetera. And that's exactly what we did here. And you can always define or each one of these functions, the max, the mean, and the quantile, to ignore the NAs we, using the argument na.rm, which is remove the NAs equals true. If you put it as false, then it's going to take into account DNA and it's probably going to give you um, either NAN or NAs. Um, so to estimate variation, the most common ones are standard deviation and the interquantile range, which is essentially. Uh, you're subtracting the 75th quantile from the 25th uh, or the 25th quantile from the 75th quantile of your data. And that is going to contain 50% of your data, like the inner 50% um, of all your data. And that's essentially what we did here. You just want to see how spread out your data is. I think everybody knows how to interpret that. Another important thing to note is that summary statistics are reductive because they reduce the distribution distribution to a single number. So that's what happens with mean, standard deviation, et cetera. But it's always good to visualize the whole distribution. So uh, to do that, histograms are usually the way to go, but there are tons of other types of graphs. Um, so here I'm just doing the departure delays, uh, essentially seeing them right here uh, as a histogram. And then I, using chord Cartesian, I just zoomed in to um, to this little bit right here, but you can't see because, yeah, here, I'm going to use my mouse. So essentially cutting it from, uh, uh, what's this, maybe minus 20 to 1,000, I'm just cutting it to minus 30 to 400. I just want to focus my attention on this little part. Um, it, and it's also a good idea to check distributions of subgroups. Subgroups. So here with this graph, essentially what we're doing is just saying, give me the the distribution, or show me how the distribution for each one of the uh, for all of the flights that were for okay, so for the for the day one and month one. That's why I have this interaction here. So day one and month one. I want to see all the departure delay that were less than 120 that coincide with that date and that month. So this is exactly what I have. So this is going to be one line is going to be day one, month one. Another line is going to be day two, month one, and so on and so forth. And the line is gonna have, if I'm not mistaken, the line is gonna have all the delays, right? 
essentially here. Um, and yeah, so it's also a good idea to check that distrib subdistribution, distribution of subgroups and not just the distribution of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, and there are other graphs to do that. The book doesn't go into much detail of how to do these graphs, but just to make aware that these are things that you should do. And then uh, positions, which are going to be, you can define this if you want it to do, uh, um, give me the value that it's on the first position, the last position, or a position that I define like the Give me the 25th value, right? You use those functions. And essentially, here's the example. Those are very easy to understand. And then to end, I think this is the last one. We these summary functions are can be paired with summarize, but sometimes it's more useful to pair them with mutate. Because the problem with summarize is well, not the problem, but the thing that summarize does is that it goes from all of the data and then it's gonna, so the output is gonna be larger. No, the input is gonna be larger than the output. But with mutate, you keep the output and the input the same length. So yeah, because summarize is essentially cutting all your data, right? It's summarizing it into one value or just one value per group. But with mutate, you keep all the rows that you have at the beginning. And these are the most common uh, ways to summarize with mutate, which is going to be the proportion of a total, uh, which is the value that you have divided by the total of that column or that group. Um, a z-score or a standardized mean, um, which is going to be essentially for each one of your values in your vector, subtract the mean and divide it by the standard deviation of all that group or all that column, uh, standardize it to a range of zero, standardize it to a range between zero and one. So it's the same thing, but what you're doing is uh, that X value that you have in your vector, subtract the minimum and divide the difference between the maximum and the minimum or your range. And then that's how you get this other type of standardization. And if you need to, compute an index based on the first observation. So what's my value relative to the first one? Then that's what you do. And then there are all the videos. So that essentially everything, I think it's a lot. It's a very dense chapter, but it's things that we already know. I think that these are like some of the functions that most of us have used a lot, a lot, a lot. and yeah, they just went through each one of them. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's all you guys. Numbers. Congratulations, Gabby. It's a, a very long chapter. Yes, yes. Yeah, you did a good. You did a good job. All right, you guys. Thank you. So I think I think that's it. So just to make sure, um, okay, so next week we have Florence that's gonna represent strength. I'm really looking forward to that chapter. That's my understanding of strength is zero. And then make sure to sign up for chapter 17 or 18 if nobody has. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>